What I'd like to tell you about today is about a relationship between uh, a topological property on the one hand and a geometric property on the other. And in the end, the final result is going to be kind of independent of these two properties. You can vary them, specify them independent of one another. So I thought I'd start out by just stating the theorem. Um, it says we only have to define one topological and one geometric term. Uh, but as such, of course, it, the result may seem unmotivated uh, and quite possibly uninteresting. So in fact, I should say up in advance that the bulk of the talk will be spent motivating this conjecture, what, or sorry, this result, this theorem, um, and how it connects into, in particular, the stuff that Fang was talking about uh, in the last talk. But I'll also, in the proof, which I'll talk a little bit about at the end, I'll be using techniques that Jesse talked about uh, yesterday, I think. So the topological side of, of this story is just the absence of homology. So um, let's say I closed through manifold is an integral homology sphere. It's an integral homology three sphere if, shockingly enough, it's integral homology matches that. Of S3. So by point grade duality and universal coefficients, actually, you only need to check that the first homology matches. This is the same as saying the first homology, which of course is the same as the unionization of the fundamental group. It's equivalent just to say that that's zero. So the, the commutator subgroup of the fundamental group is the whole, the whole group. So, uh, in the context of this talk, you should think about this as an aspect of the topology which is small, so it doesn't have at least homologically much topology, although, of course, it could be a very complicated three manifold. Uh, the geometric side, right, so by the work of Thurston and Perlman, we know that to understand the topology of three manifolds, we should look at their geometry. Uh, in particular, the most important kind of geometry is hyperbolic geometry. So I'll always be interested in hyperbolic manifolds. In my talk. So it just means it has a Romanian metric of constant curvature minus one, or maybe better think about that as saying it's a quotient of the three-dimensional hyperbolic space by the action of its fundamental group. Uh, so the geometric notion is I draw a picture down a dimension. my stand-in for M, if I pick a point X on my manifold, then, well, I mean, it's covered by our hyperbolic space, so a small, if I look at a small metric ball of some radius about that point, uh, it's just isometric, the corresponding ball in the universal cover. Um, and of course, that's actually true, maybe not just for the particular choice of radius I drew here, but maybe you know, also for a slightly larger radius. Uh, but eventually, uh, as I expand out the radius of the ball, the ball will come back and, and meet itself. Uh, and that point at which it meets itself, that's what's called the injectivity radius of the manifold at x. So injectivity radius of m at x is the supremum um, over positive numbers r so that, well, I guess we can say it this way, the ball of radius r about x is sort of embedded, or maybe better, uh, let's say it's isometric to a ball in a. So this is a function. It depends on, on where you are. In my cartoon, the injectivity radius would be bigger here or here than it is here in this sort of neck. Okay, so the, the main result, which is joint work uh, with Jeff Brock, is that there are manifolds which are topologically small in the sense that they have no 
homology, uh, but are geometrically large in the sense that their injectivity radius is big. Uh, it's big most places. So I forgot to introduce the abbreviation. I'll enter, rather than say integral homology is the old combo, right? It's ZHS. So our result is the following. Um, so given constants r and epsilon, so you should think of r as large, epsilon as small, uh, there is a hyperbolic integer homology free sphere where uh, the injectivity radius is large. Uh, I'd like to say just as large everywhere, but unfortunately we can't prove that, but it's large most places. So in particular on the scale r, if we look at the points in M where the injectivity radius is less than r, of course it depends on what it is. Maybe, maybe in this picture you've chosen the scale so that this, maybe those are the points where the injectivity radius is less than 0.5 or something, uh, then the set of such points, the yellow region in my picture, is small compared to the overall volume of the manifold. So the points where the injectivity radius is small occupies at most an epsilon proportion of the, of the manifold. So as I said, I'm going to spend the vast bulk of this talk I'm actually motivating this, uh, only a little bit spending about proof, but at least at this point, should understand what the statement is, so are there any questions? Any questions just on that? So, what are some motivations? I'll start with somehow the simpler ones and then work out to connect this with, to what? Uh, is it easier if you drop the other condition where is the is the theorem easier if you don't have the other condition about Oh about this? Yeah. Oh yes, yeah. So that's a that's a good point. Uh, is that in some sense either of these conditions is easy enough to satisfy by itself. So for instance, uh, if I wanted to make many uh, hyperbolic integral homology spheres. What would I do? I would just take uh, a hyperbolic knot, like let's say the figure eight knot, and do one on n gain surgery on some hyperbolic knot. I really only know how to draw basically one hyperbolic knot. So in this case, for instance, if I take n at least two, uh, that is a hyperbolic integer homology sphere. So in particular, it satisfies the, the first conclusion. Um, and I mean, maybe I should say, how would you make the injectivity radius big? Well, you would do that by taking covers. So maybe let me define, it's often convenient to talk about the injectivity radius of M. So this is the uh, infima of the injectivity radius as you vary the point. So it's controlled by the thinnest part of your manifold. Um, how would you make a hyperbolic manifold where the injectivity radius is large? Well, you would start with some kind of random hyperbolic free manifold, your favorite. Uh, and then you would start taking some tower of finite covers. Uh, let's make these regular over the base. Um, and then the injectivity radius of these manifolds goes to infinity. It essentially just means that you unwrap all of the topology of the manifold as you go up this cover. So in particular, any non-trivial loop in M has to be unwrapped somewhere in this tower, just to say that 
think about the fundamental groups of these covers as subgroups of the fundamental group M, it's the condition so on Thanks talk of these things intersect in the identity. So either of these conditions is easy to ensure by itself. It's the fact that you can uh, specify them <coughs> both at the same time uh, that's the tricky part. Other questions? So um, to motivation, so what is, well, I talked about, alluded to this, a profusion of geometry coming from <coughs> Perlman's proof of the geometrization theorem. Mosdell tells you in the case of hyperbolic manifolds, right, the hyperbolic structure is unique. Um, in particular, it's completely determined by the topology. <coughs> So as soon as I give you some combinatorial description of a three-manifold, like let's say I take uh, the exterior or not in the three-sphere, it has, in this case, a hyperbolic structure. And that hyperbolic structure is unique. So any invariant of that, maybe the simplest invariant of a Ramadi manifold I can think of is the volume, any invariant of that is actually a topological invariant. So in this case, the volume is 2.02988 something something. Um, and well, that's great. It gives us all these new invariants of, of manifolds coming from this geometry. But uh, it's not clear, in many cases, if I give you a combinatorial description like this, how does the volume or the length of the shortest GD stick or some eigenvalue of something or another, uh, how is that reflected from the combinatorics of of this description. I mean, you know that the geometry is determined by the topology, but uh, how does that linkage work? So this sort of falls under a kind of class of questions some people like to call quantitative mass rigidity. Uh, so for instance, this knot is an alternating knot. So by work of lack of you can actually roughly read off the volume from the common parts of the diagram. And you can think of this as a sort of an example of this. In this case, what we're showing is that you can actually bear the geometry independent of the topology. You can make the geometry big while at least keeping this one aspect of the topology small. And so that's one, maybe that's the most general motivation for considering this type of questions, understanding the linkage. between the topology and the geometry. Uh, another sort of motivation here, uh, or maybe this is just sort of prior work, uh, is if instead, I mean, so I'm, so I'm talking about the, when I talked about the integral homology sphere, we made sure we insisted that the integral homology was the same as the three sphere. But we could just ask, well, what about the rational homology? What if we just insisted that the three manifold then had no rational homology? Um, in that case, the analog of this is true. And in fact, the stronger result is true. Um, so this is work I did with Frank Caligari. Uh, well, I, as I'll explain, really, this is a theorem of Boston, Nigel Boston, and George Helenberg. Um, so there exists uh, a hyperbolic manifold M3 with covers on the one hand um, each cover is a rational homology sphere so that just means that the uh, the rational homology, the Betty number is zero. Uh, and uh, in addition, something stronger than this is true, uh, namely the uh, injectivity radius of these manifolds goes to infinity everywhere. 
that were used to prove this, uh, well, at least in my original work with, with Frank, uh, were primarily coming from number theory. So, I mean, it turns out that you know, these things you sometimes hear about, automorphic forms, which sound very scary, they're actually just cohomology classes, in particular things like cohomology classes of three manifolds. So, in the special kind of three manifold, which is called arithmetic, which, I mean, really just means those that number theorists can tell you something about, they have a lot of understanding about what the cohomology of, of these things are. So, you can use, we did use the machinery that was, say, used to prove Fermat's last theorem um, to try to control in this case, show the vanishing of the homology of these manifolds. Uh, but the problem was, you know, sometimes you go and you work in some other area or use tools from some other area, and there's a long-standing conjecture there that, well, it sure make your life a lot easier if you assume, so it's the other area, so you just assume it. Um, so our original proof uh, was contingent, um, conditional, on, well, uh, the Langlitz conjecture for GL2, or really just some technical aspects of it which haven't been established, that's kind of minor, uh, uh, conditional on the generalized Riemann hypothesis. So if you're uncomfortable with assuming the generalized Riemann hypothesis, it's harmless because uh, Boston and Ellenberg, they took the examples that we produced and analyzed them with much less highfalutin machinery, uh, namely the theory of pro p groups, uh, and they were able to prove this uh, without any assumptions. So if you just look at the rational homology, uh, you can actually impose stronger conditions on the geometry. So um, a third motivation for this, or background, uh, is the stuff that Fang was talking about in terms of um, <coughs> forging growth, or also just more generally interest in torsion homology uh, coming from number theory. As I mentioned, number theorists are interested in these automorphic forms, which are really just cohomology classes and certain nice Ramanian manifolds, like hyperbolic three manifolds. Um, and, you know, just as from our perspective, I mean, what is the torsion part of the homology telling you? It's not, unless it has something to do with the, you know, order two things. It's not like it represents a surface or something nice and geometric in your manifold, uh, but it's, it's, it's there, which is kind of, it's kind of maybe more algebraic and variant. So, like us, number theorists were not interested, um, particularly in, um, uh, torsion until recently uh, in the work of people like Akshay Venkatesh and Frank Caligari have started to develop some of the machinery that applied to the study of ordinary cohomology to study of torsion. Um, in particular, the huge breakthrough this year where someone associated to torsion uh, homology classes uh, some kind of Galois representation. So this is a sort of torsion is a increasing interest there. Now how does this connect in particular to this kind a question. Um, so let me just write up a conjecture um, closer with this is what Bang was talking about before. Let me just state the variant that he mentioned of Bergeron and Venkatesh. Uh, which I should mention, you know, this, I'm going to state this for hyperbolic three manifolds because I'm a small-minded low-dimensional topologist, but really this applies to sort of any kind of family of locally symmetric spaces. So, um, well, the, these are number theorists. So, in their original thing, the hypothesis is that uh, we have a closed arithmetic three-manifold. So, that arithmetic just means that number theorists can understand it. Um, and, uh, and then they look at, so that you take, suppose, you have a tower of finite covers, 
Um, so there, they need, should be of a special kind. So let's say tower of finite congruence covers. So what do I mean by that? You know, when I was describing earlier why you could get manifolds with large injectivity radius, I said, oh, well, you just take this sequence of subgroups shrinking to the identity. I mean, the fact that there are such subgroups is a very special property. <coughs> Lots of most, I think, in any reasonable sense, groups probably don't have that property, the property being residually finite. Um, and the reason three manifold groups do, or particular reasons hyperbolic three manifold groups do, uh, is just the fact that the, right, if you think about the fundamental group of your hyperbolic three manifold, right, it's a subgroup of isometries of hyperbolic three space, which it was talking about yesterday, that's just a Lie group. PSL2C. I mean, in particular, it's a group of matrices. Um, and if you want finite index subgroups of groups of matrices, what do you do? Well, let's just think for a second of the simplest uh, infinite group of matrices. Let's say two by two matrices with determinant one with integer coefficients. If I want a finite index subgroup of this, what would I do? Well, it's the same as saying I want a finite quotient. So just take the map onto SL2, Z mod NZ. It turns out that this is subjective. Uh, and the kernel of this is called the principal congruent subgroup. Uh, and this picture is not really dependent on the fact that these were integers. Um, your matrices here, they live in some number field by local rigidity basically integers in that number field. So whenever you have a finitely generated linear group, group of matrices, you always have these kind of congruent subgroups. And these are the ones that are, from the point of view of number theory, the most natural. So here they want to look at an arithmetic manifold and covers of this particular type, where geometrically, the covers get bigger and bigger, so all the topology is unwound. Then their conjecture uh, is that when you look at the um, let me put it over here. Then the conjecture is if you look at the first homology of this and you look at the, uh, right, so this is a free, this is a abelian group, it's got a free part, finite part, let's just focus on the torsion part, um, then this group is eventually non-trivial. In fact, it's so big that its size is growing exponentially in the volume of the manifold MN. So, uh, moreover, the growth rate is uh, with respect to volume is a universal constant independent particular manifold of the particular cars. So this is so what Thang his original conjecture is basically the limb soup of this over all covers gives you this. This is a particular series of covers that Bergeron and Benkitesh uh, proposed will realize that, that upper bound. So um, I guess I should connect this to the way he was writing it. Um, so you could also, if you want to write it this way, you could say this is saying that you take the limit, I'll keep the numerator the same, or, well, you know, let me just write it slightly differently, right? You could also think of this as saying you're taking the abelianization of the fundamental group of this manifold. And again, you're just looking at the torsion part. Uh, and you're dividing it by, uh, well, okay, this is the volume. So you can think of this as the degree. I guess I'll write it like bank it as an index. All right, this is the degree of the cover or the index of the subgroup times the volume of the base manifold. So I can flip the volume to the other side. 
So it's saying if you want to know what the volume of your hyperbolic manifold is, well, of course, you could try to compute the hyperbolic structure. But you could also take some uh, very large index subgroup, look at the size of its abelianization, compare that to the index, and that should be approximating the volume times this constant. I mean, on the one hand, it's really startling. Oh, on the other hand, it's not startling at all. Right? Mostow rigidity says that the topology, which in the case of a hyperbolic manifold is just determined by the fundamental group, that the topology of the manifold determines the geometry. So this is sort of purely about the group. Purely about the group. This is a theorem or a conjecture? This is a conjecture. It's a conjecture which has been established in exactly zero cases. <laughs> <laughs> but there are related conjectures that, uh, or theorems that uh, Fang alluded to where you use non-trivial systems of coefficients uh, in which, which this can be proven. Um, and of course the result that Fang was talking about at the end, looking at abelian covers as an example of this philosophy. So, um, so yeah, so let me, uh, are there questions about this? So, let me, uh, I mean this, there's a whole theory behind this you know, involving sort of L2 invariance and in particular um, convergence of L2 invariance by sort of normalized ordinary invariance involving analytic torsion, racing or torsion, things like this. Um, I'm just going to attempt to justify this conjecture with a picture. Well, I guess it's called a plot. Um, so, you know, this is a, this conjecture is testable. Assuming that is, well, I did test it, but the Harder part to start with. So uh, let me define the torsion ratio of a manifold just to be this quantity we're taking the limit of. So log size of the torsion divided by the volume. Oh, but let me. Uh, let me normalize this by multiplying this quantity by 6 pi. So the conjecture now is that this torsion ratio converges to 1 as you take bigger and bigger congruence covers. Okay, so here's a, a plot of this. Um, I started with some twist knots. I uh, made them into orbifolds by labeling the locus by some small integer. Um, and these are examples of those which happen to be arithmetic manifolds. Uh, and then I took uh, congruence covers as specified by the conjecture. Um, so I think there are something like a dozen base orbifolds. And then I took maybe 15,000 covers of those orbifolds, congruence covers. Um, and this is the data uh, where here we have, um, this is the axis, this is the volume of the cover. And the vertical axis is this torsion ratio. So the conjecture is that the uh, torsion ratio should converge to 1. Uh, and that is indeed what seems to happen in that picture. Is Dave. it really necessary? Ah, yes. Uh, is it necessary? Uh, we'll see. Yeah, so that's a good question. I also... For non hmm? I assume you can test it for non Exactly, I can and did. So here's the test for non arithmetic manifolds. These are also twist knot orbifolds. So topologically, these are very similar to the other ones, but these are not arithmetic. Um, and uh, what you see is that for the most part, you, the conjecture appears to hold. So most of the things are actually the torsion ratio is converging to 1. And in fact, it's converging faster than in the arithmetic case. I don't understand that. Uh, but there are some, a few outliers. Uh, they're way below. Okay, so that's um, very consistent with what you expect from Thang's theorem, which is that the limb soup of this thing is bounded. Uh, so they're, they're below, but in some cases they're way below. Does it come when you have um, positive H um, B1? Hmm? Does it come when you have um, like positive B1? Uh, yeah, so, so Stefan's question is, does it happen when it's positive B1? So that's actually what the two colors in these pictures represent. So the blue dots, maybe I'll go back to the first one originally. The blue dots correspond to covers which are rational homology spheres. First Betty number is zero. The red dots correspond to covers 
where um, the first Betty number is positive. So what do you observe in this plot between the, the pattern between the red dots and the blue dots? The blue ones are above the red ones. And actually, here's a histogram. So if you chop off the tail starting at about volume 15,000, um, and you just look at what you get, you get that the red stuff is shifted slightly compared to the blue stuff. Um, and that's actually what you expect. Um, it's much more marked here. So here, well, for one thing, there were very few red dots. In this case, the congruence covers almost all consisted of rational homology spheres. Uh, but the few red dots that there, some of them were way below. Uh, way below. And so under the hood, I mean, really, one can interpret this type of conjecture as a conjecture about uh, convergence of analytic or racing or torsion to the appropriate L2 invariant of the universal cover. Um, and that analytic torsion has three components, one of which is boring, one of which is uh, this, and the other which is something called the regulator, uh, which is a property of the first cohomology. Uh, and so if you don't have any regulator term, uh, then it's just it's equivalent to this. And what this means is that sometimes in these non-arithmetic cases, you have the very large regulator. Uh, whereas there are a number of theoretic reasons to believe in the arithmetic case, there is, uh, the regulator is always small. So if you strike arithmetic here, uh, the conjecture, well, I'm guessing it's not true exactly as written um, because of those low dots. But there's a variant of it where you replace this with the racing or torsion, which definitely should still be true. Are you neglecting the ingenuity radius in these pictures? Neglecting it? Yes, it's not plotted. Um, and in fact, if I were being honest, <clears throat> these are not regular covers. So um, they're, they're covers where the injectivity radius is probably going to infinity in most places, but not everywhere. They're what's sort of gamma zero congruence covers, not principal congruence covers. Questions? Do you okay. expect the same behavior for other types of covers? Hmm? Do you expect the same behavior for other types? Yeah, that's a really good question. I mean, these, so these are the kind of covers that are easy to write down because they come from the, um, you know, the whole nomi representation and reduce the entries modulo some ideal, and then you just write down these things. Uh, it's very natural to ask what happens in some in some other tower of covers, and I haven't I haven't looked at that. I mean, it sort of seems like it should be feasible to look at, um, and uh, yeah, it'd be really interesting to see what happens. In fact, for almost all rational homologous numbers, seems very special. Well, or non-special, anti-special. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not. Yeah, I mean, well, the difference between what happens in the non-arithmetic case and the arithmetic case is really striking, right? I and mean, here you're getting almost all rational homology spheres. And the other one, it was like it's basically actually 50-50. Um, uh, and that, well, and there's, there's a lot of arithmetic manifolds have a lot of cohomology, sometimes coming from uh, sort of transference or base change from, from other groups like the modular group SLTZ. Um, but uh, but yeah, so I, I think this is reasonable that somehow generically it's a rational homology here. You, you can think of, you know, you're computing the homology of this cover, it's basically you have some giant sparse matrix. Probably generically that thing has determinant non-zero. So. Other questions? Yeah, so the Okay, so that's, uh, that's the data. I have to suffice for trying to convince you that this conjecture is reasonable. Um, now, how does this, if someone quite managed to connect this back to the theorem, um, I mean, the theorem is about, well, okay, so now we've been talking about torsion growth. So these are examples where there's no homology, torsion or otherwise. Uh, and the injectivity radius, well, it's not going to infinity, but it's sort of big most places. Uh, in fact, this condition is really quite natural turns out, uh, again, if you sort of talk about what happens to the first Betty number, I mean, some sense, I think I always give this talk backwards. I, I start with talking about what happens looking at the whole homology, and I backfill what happens just looking at the rational homology, which is a simpler picture. But having made that narrative choice, I have to stick to it. So. Um, 
So this is this thing that Fang alluded to. Uh, Benji P. Schramm convergence. So what is this? This is a very weak notion of geometric convergence. So we have um, some closed hyperbolic free manifolds. And um, so I'm going to say that these converge to H3 in the sense of Benjamin H. Ram if, um, so I should say that it's kind of confusing notation maybe. So if before my MNs have always been towers of covers of some fixed manifold, these manifolds are unrelated to, are a priori unrelated to one another. Just any sequence of closed hyperbolic manifolds. Um, so converge is if for every r greater than zero, uh, if we look at and introduce notation for this. Let me call this. We have a manifold, the portion where the injectivity radius is less than R. We call that the R thin part. Um, then, if for every scale R, the limit of the volume of the thin part. Uh, compared to the volume of the whole manifold, uh, this is always zero. So that's a, a new, so in other words, if you go way out in the sequence and you pick a random point, it has a big neighborhood which looks like H3, where you get to specify by choice of R what you mean by big. So for example, what are examples of this convergence? Well, if you had some power of covers like we've been talking about, where the injectivity radius goes to infinity. Uh, but as I said, they really, the key thing is that these are need not be related. Yes. Is that convergence equivalent to Gromov Hausdorff with random base points? Um, it's equivalent to Gromov Hausdorff with random base points. Um, I mean, morally, that's that's the idea. I'm not sure if it's precisely the case. What do you mean? Uh, thin part again? If there if the manifolds are closed, then there's no thin part. No, it's, it's the R thin part. So R is the scale. So uh, you should think of, I get to choose R really big, like a billion, much, much bigger than the Margulis constant. And then I'm looking at all points which don't have an embedded ball of radius a billion. And that's what I'm calling the R thin part. Which I don't know. Hmm? And, and the not. Yes. Thank you, Seth. Are there questions? OK, so boy, this is some really, so I mean, so towers of covers is sort of been studied a long time, looking at convergence of the homology, normalized, thanks stated some of those results. Um, this extremely weak notion of geometric convergence uh, turns out to be enough to actually give a uh, convergence of, of topology on the level of rational, rational homology. So the following theorem. Uh, proved by uh, Albert, Bergeron, Beringer, uh, Delander, Nikolov, Revolt, and Samet. Uh, they show that if you have your sequence of manifolds converges in the Benjamini Schramm to sense to H3, then when you look at um, the first Betty number of these things. So just the rank of the homology with rational coefficients, or the rank of the free part of the immunization, uh, and you divide, you normalize that by the volume, 
then that always uh, goes to zero. Right, so what Farber was looking at was the case where these manifolds are all towers of this, they're all covers of the same, the same manifold. The beautiful thing about this is these manifolds not related, they can be incommensurable. Um, right, so but this, as I pointed out, this is a generalization of, of earlier work of Farber. Uh, I mean, the point is, you know, zero occurs in a number of different guises in mathematics. Uh, this zero is the first L2 Betty number of hyperbolic free space as uh, is computed analytically by Watt. Um, uh, so, so this, yeah, so this is the generalization of these work of, of people like Luke and Farber, Gromov. But now into context, not we're taking covers of a fixed thing, but you're taking this kind of general limit. All right, so, so what we have so far, so we have this kind of theorem which says that uh, benjamini schramm convergence gives you some kind of convergence in topology. We have a conjecture, of which there are no proved examples, which is that um, as you take these covers with larger and larger injectivity radius, uh, you're supposed to have more and more growth in the torsion in the homology. Uh, and I should say that this 6 pi is also an L2 invariant. This is called the L2 analytic torsion of hyperbolic free space. Um, so you might think or hope that this type of convergence of geometry should also force some kind of convergence of torsion. And so in particular, if you have a sequence of manifolds, benjamini schramm converging to H3, then in particular the torsion of those things should grow, grow rapidly. Uh, and that's not true. That's what our theorem says. This is really the motivation for why we proved it. So a corollary of our result um, is, I mean, you can use this by bearing R and epsilon to build. There's a sequence Mn of integer homology three spheres. Which Benjamini Schramm converge to H. So, in particular, somehow this convergence of torsion, even though there's good evidence for this conjecture, both the experimental stuff and various related theorems, um, its convergence of that sort of torsion is somehow much more subtle than the convergence of the, just the bend. So, for, for the torsion, you, you really need the covers and not the. Well, I mean, I don't know. I mean, right. So you, can, so certainly, you need more than, more than this. But now, what if you insisted that the injectivity radius go to infinity everywhere in these m? Right. That. So you don't. So this, this thing is eventually empty for all r. Um, that might still be enough to give you exponential torsion growth because we don't understand. It will turn out, and the proof of this, we don't understand what the injectivity. We really prove only that statement. We don't have, we somehow don't do anything that indicates we can make the injectivity radius big everywhere. So if you ask me, can I replace this conclusion with just the injectivity radius is bigger than R? I don't know if that's true. I really don't have a good sense. Sense what that's true. So, all right, so that was uh, theorem and motivation. As promised, it took the majority of my thought. So in the last 10 minutes, I'd like to uh, just sketch the proof. So unlike the theorem that I foolishly just started erasing with the rational homology spheres where the construction came out of number theory, um, if you believe Bergeron and Venkatesh, uh, there's no way you're going to construct these things by taking covers of, of arithmetic math. So um, our techniques are rather different. Uh, we'll use machinery from Kleinian groups, uh, in particular that Jesse talked about, about last time. So the context is we have uh, some surface. 
And uh, let's say we have a homeomorphism of that surface. Now, out of this thing, there's a, we can build a couple different three manifolds. Right? Uh, one of which, uh, let me just remind you from Jesse's talk, uh, one of which is the mapping torus. So you take um, surface cross circle, uh, and then you go to the top to the bottom, VR map F. So that's a three manifold. The point cross surface gives you a nice vibration. of the manifold over, over the circle. Um, and the other thing you can do out of this is you could uh, look at a Hagar's plane. So we just regard S as the boundary of H. H is just a handle body and neighborhood. It's kind of standard looking graph. So it's a solid manifold boundary. Uh, so we could take two copies of this handle body and glue the boundary by half. Uh, now you might wonder why I'm even mentioning this mapping course. Because I, I want to build integer homology spheres, right? Um, and uh, well, these are never even rational homology spheres. They're first any number. is positive. I mean, after all, this is a homologically non-trivial surface. Um, so it turns out, though, that uh, it's much easier to control the geometry of a mapping torus. And even though, in the end, we're going to use this construction, a Hagar's point, which of course is a universal construction, every three manifold has one of these, uh, it turns out that you can photocopy in the appropriate context, you can photocopy geometry from a mapping torus over to a Hagar's plane. And this is in spite of the fact that somehow this role of S in these two objects is very different. Right, this is an incompressible surface. It's a fiber in this vibration. Uh, the surface here is kind of, well, it's maximally compressible. You can compress it com away completely both in one direction and the other. Uh, so the, the basic photocopying result that I'll need We need to be a little more precise than, more, well, we need a little few more details than Jesse did, so I'm going to go ahead and just restate it. Uh, this is something that I guess first appeared in the Mazi's thesis. So let's assume our map here, F, is a pseudo Nothoff. Um, and it's sort of sufficiently generic, I won't dwell on what that means, then what the Mazi does is you can compare the geometry of the mapping torus of f, or, or really of a power of f. Right? So the mapping torus of f to the n, I guess that's just the cyclic cover of this manifold, where you unwrap n times. So, Uh, so this surface here ends up repeating itself n times. Apparently n is fairly large. Uh, but it's made up of these isometric blocks here. It's completely symmetric. Uh, so the Mazda tells you that if you look at the Hagard splitting, associated to f the n. It looks something like this. So this is sort of one handle body. Here's the other handle body. In the middle, I have surface cross interval. There's some kind of surfaces in here. Um, and the point is that in the middle, of this Hagard splitting, you get n minus k blocks nearly isometric. To um, this block b, so 
this thing is almost isometric to this. Okay, I've got to draw it just kind of. Well, it's more isometric than that. Uh, of course, I guess so far this is a vacuous statement, because I can just take k to be n, and then this has no content. So the point is, this is fixed. Independent of n. All right, so if I look at some big enough power here, like power 100, I'll get 96 copies of this block that are almost, I mean, what k is depends on what you mean by nearly, but um, which are almost isometric to be. Does it depend on that? It absolutely depends on it, yes. Uh, and then, in addition, so there's kind of these, um, kind of down here in the cores of these handle bodies, uh, you don't really know what's happening down there, <coughs> um, but you do know, and this is important, that in these things, the geometry here converges as n goes to infinity. So I don't know what it is, but it's not like becoming these, you know, it's not like a lot of volume hiding in here. When you do n really big, almost all just looks like copies of b, just like this. So how is that? So I'm going to use that to uh, outline the proof of the theorem. So so here's the proof. The idea, the construction, how are we going to build these manifolds? So let's fix our scale R. So I need to build you an integral homology sphere where the injectivity radius is at least R most places. So my first step is I'm just going to pick um, some pseudo also of f so that the injectivity radius, not of the Hagar splitting, but of the mapping torus, uh, is bigger than, just give myself enough rope to hang myself with, um, let's say it's at least r plus 1. So how would you do that? You would take any hyperbolic mapping torus, and then you would just take a giant cover of that where the injectivity radius is large. And then the vibration here, foliation by surfaces, pulls back to one of that cover. Of course, the genus of the surface has increased, presumably, when you did that. Um, maybe I'll just remark over here that the, uh, the genus of the surface is going to have to be exponentially large in R. So, um, proportional to R. So a huge genus, but so what? Um, uh, the second thing is, uh, so let me pick two other homeomorphisms of S. So pick G um, from S to itself, uh, which doesn't, which acts trivially on the homology of S. So if I was being using fancy language, it's an element of the Torelli subgroup of the mapping class group. Uh, and a uh, second one, uh, I mentioned earlier that, of course, every three manifold has a Hagot split. Uh, and as Jesse pointed out last time, that we know exactly what the Hagot splittings for X3 are. There's only one of them in any given genus. Uh, so I just want H to be a map which builds me S3. So then, what's my construction going to be? So um, let me define Mn. Do it up here. So let me define mn to be the thing, we take the Hagar splitting of the following map. So I'll take a big power of f, then I'll do g, then I'll do big power of f inverse, and then I'll do h. So that's some 
three manifold. Um, and well, what do we know about this three manifold? Well, it's a uh, integral homology sphere. Right? If you want to understand the homology of the manifold associated with the Hagar splitting, what you need to understand is how the gluing map acts on the homology of the surface. How does this map act on the homology of the surface? Well, this does something very complicated that I have no idea what it is. This does nothing. I was chosen to do nothing. This undoes whatever unknown thing I did at the start. Um, so this map here, right, this acts on H1 of S just as H does. Which means that homologically, we can't distinguish this manifold from the three sphere. So indeed, it is an integral homology sphere. Uh, what about geometrically? Uh, well, generalization of this kind of picture will tell us here's a schematic of our manifold MN. Um, I'll just I'll draw it like this. So there'll be a, some whole bunch of blocks. Uh, basically, I'm sort of thinking about this map broken up into pieces. So this is kind of, this block corresponds to doing F1s, F1s like this. So there's a whole bunch of blocks like this. Um, there'll be something in the middle that's going to correspond to doing G. Uh, I'm not going to really know what goes on in these question mark regions. Um, and then I guess here, of some more blocks <coughs> corresponding to F inverse, Like so, the backwards copies of B. Uh, and so these, these regions here um, these are almost isometric to the block in the mapping torus of F. So in particular in these regions, the injectivity radius is at least R. So I don't know what's happening in these mystery regions, but uh, you do know that the geometry is converging. So the thin part, the R thin part, is contained, contained there. So that when we look at um, the volume of the R thin part and divide by the volume of the whole manifold, this is basically, well, it's basically less than or equal to the volume of these three question mark real limit regions, whatever they might be, uh, divided by well, most of the volume of this thing is just going to come from the blocks. So basically, the volume of this manifold is n times the volume of the block, which is the volume of the mapping force. So in particular, this goes to 0. So no matter what epsilon you specify, I can make n big enough so that the volume of the thin part uh, is a very small proportion of the volume. So that's a sketch of the proof, and I'll stop there. Thank you for your time. Any questions for the speaker? There's supposed to be four Fs or three Fs. Four Fs. Well, right. So, right. So it's n minus k or something like that. So, so yeah. So I guess I was kind of thinking. I wasn't thinking, really, of course, but. Uh, somehow the geometry means that maybe you would know that you had like sort of you know n minus three blocks here, but n minus two blocks here. So that's I mean that was my excuse for not drawing it symmetrically. But, yeah. How do you know that the geometry converges? The right. Well, I mean this is yeah. Of that's really the key part of the proof. Um, I mean this comes from there's kind of different ways that you can think about it. Uh, so uh, it comes out of the machinery that, for instance, is used to prove the ending lamination classification of finding groups. So the idea is you, you want to understand all geometric limits of these manifolds.
Um, and so basically, there are many of them. Uh, you get something that looks like this. Marching out the end, or the mirror of that, or just the infinite single cover of the fiber. Organic, this is the mirror of this thing. Um, and then, so you showed the boson all the possible geometric limits, and then you need some kind of theorem to tell you that what you get is sort of approximately what you, I mean, so the, the naive thing to do, well, I don't know if it's naive, but what you want to do is you want to take this picture and this picture, and you want to sort of superimpose them. And well, the metrics aren't quite the same, because this, sort of, this will be sort of asymptotic to B. It's not actually B. Um, so you perturb the metrics slightly to glue it up, and you do the same thing here. So you, you sort of build from this a manifold of highly pinched negative curvature, sort of between curvature minus 1 and minus 1 minus epsilon, that has exactly this structure. Um, and, and then you can either use the theorem of Tn, which says that that's close to a hyperbolic structure. Um, that's maybe easiest if you understand Tn's theorem, which I don't. Or alternatively, um, you use some stuff coming out of the, the ending lamination theorem to, to sort of pin down the structure. You get a Bialipschitz model, like so, which is kind of combinatorial, but then you compare that to this and see that you can Let's thank the speaker again.